Good morning. I'm used to a congregation that talks back to me, so I might ask you to talk back to me a little bit this morning. I bring you greetings this morning from the Riverside Church in the city of New York. I'm Amy Butler. I'm the senior minister. How many of you have been to the Riverside Church? Okay, so those of you who have been there will know I'm feeling a little bit at home here this morning. Our sanctuaries are very similar, and I want to thank you for having me here today, and many thanks to your pastor, Dr. Cole Glazier, who invited me to be with you here today while he's on sabbatical. Good for you, church, for sending your pastor on sabbatical. And thanks so much for the warm welcome that you've given me over these past couple of days. It is just wonderful to be with you here this morning. Like perhaps many of you, I worked my way through college doing a variety of odd jobs, the oddest of which, I think, was Old Testament tutor to the Baylor University men's basketball team. <laughs> my job was to help the basketball players to be sure that they passed the required survey of Old Testament course. So we would all meet up to study and the players would sit back, cross their arms, get ready to be bored. They'd put their feet up on the coffee table and I would stare at those huge feet and I would gulp and I would try to hit the high points of the lesson that we were studying. Inevitably, in every single lesson, one of them would lurch out of his glazed over stupor to look at me with surprise and exclaim, you mean that's in the Bible? You know, the Bible's a pretty risque book if you read it through. And so I'd sit back and I would all of a sudden feel cool which was a very uncommon feeling for me. <laughs> if you don't know this already, you should know that there are many stories in the Bible that rise above the mundane reports of human life to the downright ridiculous. And today we heard one of those passages. And I have to say this because I'm visiting you here in Los Angeles this morning, but our Hebrew lesson today from the book of Second Kings would give any Hollywood scriptwriter a run for her money. Pretty good, right? Yeah. Because it's a story full of dramatic themes of human living. Politics, intrigue, power. It's one ridiculous turn of events after another. You and I, we should be sitting upright in our pews and saying incredulously, you mean that's in the Bible? Because who among us has not wondered if we are really seeing God at work in our lives or whether we should just give in to our reasonable reaction to sigh with disgust and exclaim, that's ridiculous. And then get back to life as we know it. The story of Naaman, the great commander of the army of Aram, what we know as Syria today, happens right in the middle of a cycle of stories about Israel's brand new prophet, Elisha. Remember that the people of Israel had begged God for a king. They wanted to be just like all the other nations all around them. And it started off fairly well. And it hit its high point probably with the monarchy of King David, Israel's most famous king. But I have to tell you, it went straight downhill after that. By the time we get to 2 Kings, the story isn't centered on the monarchy anymore. Israel's kings had proven to be either completely ineffectual or totally corrupt, and God was sick and tired of it. Which is why this story focuses uh, this part of the Hebrew text on Israel's prophets, those whom God sent to the people to give them important messages in the face of these inept monarchs. The book of 2 Kings is full of story after story, of prophets bringing messages to the people. But our passage today starts out a little bit differently. Here we find ourselves all of a sudden, not in Israel, but in Aram, hearing about the devastating illness of the greatest commander ever, 
of Aram's army, Naaman. He was a powerful man, we read. He was known throughout the region because the last time he went to Israel, there were devastating effects. The Syrian army had attacked Israel and taken many, many of their people away into slavery. But it seems, as you and I know, that illness is no respecter of persons because even the deadliest commander of the most powerful army in the region suddenly finds himself struck with leprosy, a disease that would disfigure him, but worse, it would cut him off forever from his community. We know it as Hansen's disease, and it's almost eradicated in our modern day, but back in biblical times, it was deeply, deeply feared. You know what leprosy does. It deadens the nerve endings in your fingers and your limbs, and it leaves the sufferer very, very disfigured. Worse, it's extremely contagious if it's not treated. So everyone in biblical times lived in deadly fear of contracting leprosy. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that we lived in deadly fear of that. And the modern approach to dealing with leprosy is to quarantine those who have it. In Hawaii, where I grew up, there is a very famous leper colony called Kalau Papa on the island of Molokai. It was found in 1865, and from then until now, over 8,000 people have found their homes there in that colony. Of course, given modern medicine, all of the people who live in Kalau Papa can come back into regular society. But today there are 40, about 40 elderly residents who live there. And though they've been offered the opportunity to come out, one elderly man said, I'm all crippled. What am I ever going to do outside? How am I going to live? They're still called patients by the state and by each other. And though they've been cleared of the disease, they still live in this ghost-like neighborhood consisting of a few rural buildings and single-story homes. In their community, there are no schools, no children, no movie theaters, no sunbathers on the beach, no restaurants, no supermarkets. There is no traffic signal for the little road that winds through the settlement toward the airport, which is a barn. The region is accessible only by small planes or boats or mules that carry tourists down the steep cliff trail. After the last patient dies and moves away, the National Park Service will take over Kalau Papa. How is that for depressing? Observing the stigma of this horrible disease and even the stigma it carries now, we can understand how tragic this turn of events was for Naaman. With the very first diagnosis of this disease, he knew if something miraculous didn't happen, he was going to be cut off from his career, from his family, from his community forever. So what does this have to do with the people of Israel? And why would this story be included in 2 Kings? The people of Israel lived in fear of Aram's army. They should have been happy that Naaman had leprosy. Well, this is the part of the story where it starts to become ridiculous. It's a slave girl, a young Israelite girl that had been captured in the last wave of terror and brought into the community of Aram. He, uh, she was living in Naaman's household. She was a slave to Naaman's wife. And upon hearing about this horrible diagnosis, she said to her mistress, there is a prophet in Israel who can heal my master. Which leads to the next ridiculous part of the story, where Naaman goes to his king and says, King, I've heard of this man, this prophet in Israel. I know there are enemies, but I would really like it if you would ask him to heal me. So the king of Aram says, no problem. I'm going to write a letter. I'll send it over to the king of Israel, and I'll have him instruct his prophet to heal you. Ridiculous. 
And here's where it adds, uh, ratchets up to a whole new level and terrifies the king of Israel who breaks open the seal to his letter and sees that the king of Aram is asking him for a little favor. My most important commander, you know, the one who has devastated your entire country, is sick. He needs to be healed. I need you to heal him. And so... Here it is with the king of Israel tearing his clothes in utter despair. This is the end of our country. If I can't do this, that's going to be the end. So can you see what I mean about this text being soap opera worthy? The king of Israel tore his clothes in a panic, and in the next ridiculous turn of events, Elisha, the prophet who hears of the king's distress, just sends a letter over to Naaman and says, why don't you just come on over? So Naaman gathers all of his chariots together in a full force military display. He pulls up to the front gate of Elisha's compound and he says, tell your master that I, Naaman, am here. Elisha says, ridiculously, I'm too busy. Uh, And so he asks his servant to just go out to Naaman and say, here's what you got to do. Got to just go down to the Jordan River, wash yourself seven times, and you'll be just fine. This, as you might imagine, adds insult to injury. Elisha the prophet couldn't even take a moment to come out and say hello. And everyone there must have gasped in horror when they heard about the instructions. The Jordan River in in that part of the world was a sludge-filled trickle. Just a bunch of mud. Nothing compared to the beautiful, beautiful rivers of Naaman's homeland. You wouldn't really want to wash in the Jordan at all. Because you'd come out so much dirtier than when you went in and Naaman He is just incensed. This whole exchange is insulting beyond belief, and he's ready to throw in the towel and give up. What had he been thinking anyway? But the story turns here again in yet another ridiculous way when Naaman's slaves say to him, Hold on, hold on. If the prophet of Israel had asked you to do something hard, you would have done it. In an instant, why not give the wash and be clean approach a try? What can it hurt? So, risking yet more ridiculousness, Naaman went down to the Jordan River. He immersed himself in the sludgy trickle seven times. And just like Elisha told him, when he came up, his skin was healed. It looked like the skin of a little child. The text says, he was clean. But just wait, it gets even more ridiculous. Naaman is bowled over. Can you imagine the relief that he felt upon being healed? And so he goes back to Elisha and he says, I'm going to need to take some cartloads of dirt home with me so I can remember this. And also, Elisha, I know you're the prophet of Yahweh, but I'm going to have to tell you that my professional um, responsibilities will not allow me to do that one little thing that Yahweh requires, that whole worship one God only. And the prophet of Israel, who proclaimed the message of one God who will not tolerate the worship of idols, then does something even more ridiculous. Elisha turns to Naaman, who has unbelievably encountered God in the most ridiculous series of events you can imagine. And he says to Naaman, go in peace. Go in peace. You know, I wonder sometimes if you and I are so sure that we know how it is that God speaks to us and how God works in our lives and in this world that we are too quick to dismiss what seems like mundane or ridiculous. We know how God shows up 
We've codified it so many different ways, building rules and boxes and doctrines for every experience of human living. But what if our intent waiting for God leads us to result in missing God's work right among us and within us? You know this story. You've heard it all a hundred times. There's a man who's caught in a flood who makes his way to the roof of his house where he prays desperately to God for someone to save him. And a rowboat goes by, but he says, no thanks. He's waiting for God to come and save him. And next is a Coast Guard boat who shows up and he says, no, no, thanks. I'm waiting for God. Next, a helicopter comes by and he declines to jump on until the floodwaters cover him and he dies. Showing up in heaven, he complains to God how he prayed and prayed and prayed for God to save him. But God never did. And God says, a rowboat, a Coast Guard boat, a helicopter, all sent, all ignored. You and I. We know that God is at work in the world and in our lives. We have seen it over and over again. The thing is that we get to choose. We get to choose whether we're going to recognize God's presence and God's call in our lives. We might ignore it altogether because it seems so wholly ridiculous. Because we have a set idea of how it is God must show up and work in our lives. And maybe when you and I live chained to those expectations, we dismiss God's invitation in our lives as something mundane or just downright downright ridiculous. Wash in a muddy river seven times? Are you crazy? With the courage to try, though, we break the water the seventh time healed. Healed in ways that maybe we never, ever imagined. What is God doing in your life? Does it seem ridiculous? If so, it might be worth looking again. It might be worth paying a little more attention. You and I are now living in a political cycle that is Hollywood-worthy, if I say so myself. If you're like me, perhaps this Independence Day, you are wondering where God might possibly show up to move our country away from nationalist and racist rhetoric toward the ideals of liberty and justice for all on which our country was founded. If it all seems a little too ridiculous to think that God is at work, remember the way in which even the most powerful are subject to the limitations of this world, but God, God is not. God works in this world, in this country, in our lives, in ways that defy belief that should leave you and me just incredulous. If you have any doubt about that, please remember a man who lived on this earth, who healed people in all kinds of ways, who taught them the radical power of unrestrained love. He was killed. He died a terrible death in a demeaning way. And the world saw failure. Just another ridiculous zealot. And they went on to the next big thing. But there were some... There were a few who looked a little closer, and in so doing, they met the one who transformed their lives, Jesus Christ. Friends, God is not often in the business of giving us what we expect. Neither will God conform to our own individual expectations for God's work in this world and in our lives. But God is here among us, even in the bleakest moments, always, always surprising us with the persistent march of justice and healing and hope in our country, in our world, in our lives. And so this morning, for our hearts to be open to what might seem just downright ridiculous, we pray. Believing in the ridiculous claim that God is always working for our good in every time and every place always. May it be so. 
Amen.